Hey there, Margie Bryce here bringing you the Krabby Pastor podcast. And I don't think you're going to be too surprised to know that it's too easy today to become the Krabby Pastor. Our time together will give you food for thought to help you be the ministry leader fully surrendered to God's purposes and living into whatever it takes to get you there and keep you there. So we're talking about sustainability in ministry. Hey, I am here this morning with Tim Gaines, and he is going to talk with us about sabbatical and both from the pastoral and the professoral I think that's a word, sort of, standpoint. Um, But first, uh, Tim, would you introduce us? Introduce us to you. (laughs) Sorry. I'd be happy to. No, no, I'd be happy to. And you feel free to ask anything you want to know about who you're talking to this morning. But um, I have been serving as a full-time professor at Trevecca in Nashville for the last uh, eight years, starting my ninth year now. Previous to that, I was in full-time pastoral ministry in very and then various capacities. I've been a worship pastor, youth pastor, been lead pastor, now in a kind of educational role. But I also serve as a pastor on the team at the church on Trevecca's campus. And so I just can't stay away from it. I, I love mm-hmm. that work too much to just let go of it. <laughs> and so that's what I've been doing. So this last uh, year, I became eligible for a sabbatical from the university. And this was my very, very first one. I'd never done one before. And I had just hadn't been at a place long enough previously to to have that. Uh, but this is the first one. And so I'm really glad you asked me to talk about this. I, I've, I've really hoped that some of the reflections that I've had will help other people be able to do this kind of thing well. I've heard this kind of thing for a long, long time. I went to a lot of uh, conferences and conventions and those kinds of things where I've heard people just talk and talk and talk and talk about how good it is. I'm on the wagon now. I get it. <laughs> I understand the ne- necessity of these things. And so anyway, thanks for letting me lend my voice to this to this conversation. Great, great. Because there is no one handing out medals for not taking a sabbatical. Is there somebody handing out medals for that? I don't think so. <laughs> so That's right. Yeah, as sports. a matter of fact, it's kind of the opposite. Yeah. Like I, we are actually <laughs> handing out awards for people doing longer, harder, more grueling work. But you're, you're onto something there. We probably need to culturally shift the conversation where we're actually providing some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, a reward for people who want to do this kind of work that is work, but to take seriously the the kind of rest that we need to be able to, to last for a while in this kind of work. Yeah, I recently dug up my philosophy of life that I did while I was in the doctoral program at Ashland Theological Seminary and dredged myself back through that. And there was a phrase in there that really caught my eye in my you know, mission, personal mission statement that said, fueled by rest. And I Mm. thought, hmm, have I forgotten that? I don't know. But I think there is something to be said for just stopping. Just stop for a minute. (laughs) So, so you were eligible through Trevecca, correct? But you also, yeah, you also, I mean, did you double dip on the pastoral or no? (laughs) Yeah. So maybe just one other word of kind of introduction and context is that I am, by nature, I'm an achiever. I have always just gone pedal to the metal. And if for anybody who does Enneagram stuff, I know that it can be just uh, overblown in some conversations, but I'm an Enneagram three with a four wing, which means that I tend to be an achiever. I tend to be a doer. And I also tend to be the kind of person who goes into a community and I am never halfway into the communities I associate with. I like to be the kind of person who's all in. I go in with both feet and I look around just by my wiring and say, okay, what do I need to do to be the best member of this community that I can possibly be? What does this community want from me? How can I be the best contributing member? And that 
doesn't often include resting well or taking a break from that community, stepping away from the community. So this has been, uh, in many ways, for me, an act of discipline. And I recognized that the moment that I started to say, okay, well, I'm going to take a sabbatical from the university, which means that I really am going to stop teaching classes for a semester. I'm going to, I don't have to attend meetings or serve on committees or those kinds of things, but I'll probably still be on campus. You know, I still want to meet with students. I still want to get together for coffee. And then at the church, I thought, well, I don't want to be away for the whole semester from the church. Um, So maybe I'll do maybe just every other week, maybe I'll, I'll be there for one Sunday and then not the next Sunday. And I'll be there for one Sunday and not the next Sunday after that. And suddenly it all hit me. I'm really resisting this thing. I'm not really giving myself to the fullness of what this possibly could be. And so I said, time to reset. And we can talk about that in a little while, how I shaped the sabbatical and what I had to overcome in order to, I think, put a sabbatical plan together that really worked well. But early on, it was I was not setting myself up for a lot of success there or to be able to rest, to fuel myself with rest, to be able to go back to the work that I love to do. So I finally decided eight weeks from the church, just a hard eight weeks. I'm not going to go back to the to the, to the building. I'm not going to try to engage or to get involved in stuff. And it was a full 16, 15, 16 weeks from the university where I went in closed my office, drew the blinds, and uh, thought, I really need to make this an act of discipline to not go back and, and be a part of this. Isn't it interesting how hard it is to stop? I mean, we just, you know, it, it's easier just to keep going, or we think, we think that it's easier. I'll just keep, I'll just keep going. And really, we need to We need to stop. Can you share with us how your sabbatical came about and what you did to get set up for it? Great question. At university, you have to apply and you have to put a plan together. Now, that's dangerous territory for someone who's wired like me. Um, The good news is I had a colleague who had gone on sabbatical the year before I did, and her discipline was, was psychology. And so she reported back to the faculty. That's part of what we have to do when we come back. And I will do this sometime in the next academic year. I will present to the faculty my report of sabbatical, what I've done, those kinds of things. And so she she reported to the faculty. She said, I wrote an article and I rested. And that was enough. That was a good, good thing. Well, I'm glad to have that in front of me um, because when I started to put my sabbatical plan together, I attempted to fill up every single component of the sabbatical. So I thought, okay, from December until March, I'm going to write a book. And that's what I'm going to do. And then and then from March until May, that's going to be where I'm going to achieve all of these other things. I want to meet with all these different people and I want to start this new program. I thought about starting another degree program. I mean, I just thought this is my chance to do all of the things that I've ever wanted to do. And then I realized I'm probably going to end up becoming more tired. And so through wise counsel, Mm -hmm. I decided I needed to look more for balance because I am just not the type of person who would come away from a sabbatical feeling good about it. If I just sat around and watched Netflix for two months, (laughs) I probably would feel, or I really would probably feel worse about myself and my sabbatical. And so the name of the game became balance. I was also, to be honest, listening to a lot of voices from people who just kept saying, here's what you need to do with your sabbatical. Here's what you have to, how it should be structured. Here's what you need to do. You shouldn't do this. You should do this. I was also listening to people who were saying in incredibly loving ways to me, this is a really special time. Don't just let it go by. Um, And so if I could just be really, really honest, Margie, I, I felt like I had this weight on my Mm -hmm. shoulders of having (laughs) to do the perfect sabbatical such that I felt like any plan I was ever going to put together just wasn't going to be good enough. It wasn't going to live up to this kind of like magical mythos that it had surrounding it. And so there came a day when I was sitting, I think here at the table and I just thought to myself, I really do know what I want to do with my sabbatical. I just need to make that plan and actually do it. And so 
that's what I took away from this. I had to, in some sense, take the wisdom from the voices that had gone before, but also not let those voices crowd out what I knew I really wanted to do with my sabbatical. Because in some respect, I felt like I was trying to appease all of those voices. Mm-hmm. Oh, I need to do this. And I need, it needs to be like the most spiritually formative time in my life that I've ever had. I need to go like complete solitude and go pray with monks. And that's all I need to do. And I also need to write a book and I need to do you know this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> no pressure there. <laughs> and, and it became, I became paralyzing uh, in mm-hmm. terms of the plan. And so I think the best wisdom that I came away with was simply listen deeply to what you know you want to do. Your the spirit and and however the spirit works through your own life experience and your body and those kinds of things is probably telling you here's what you need to do with this sabbatical and it's worth listening to that. So there came a moment where I just felt like that weight lifted off. I sketched it out on a piece of paper. I said this is what I want to do and this looks really life-giving and it was exactly that. It was wonderful. So that's how it came together. I ended up writing that book over the first couple of months. I was under contract uh, to write a, a book. Some people would look at that and say, well, you, you shouldn't be doing that. That's I know. Work. I was wondering if that was cheating, but <laughs> maybe not. Um, so if I could be honest, it was the creative outlet mm. that I needed. It became a spiritual discipline. Um, I started the sabbatical with a, an author's retreat. This is... Um, IVP academic, wonderful publisher who invited 20 of their authors under contract to come together for a retreat that was part spiritual formation. We met with a spiritual director who could kind of take us through um, kinds of things. We, we met one another, we, we built friendships, we worked on our writing, and I realized this is a really joyful way for me to create. It became more of a hobby than it did work. And so I think the book will probably bear that, uh, that mark of, of me just spending a lot of time reading scripture and reflecting and walking and engaging in conversation with people who I respect and trust. And I think all of that will be there, but I was able, I think, to take a break and say, I don't need to achieve this book. I just need to delight in the process that is the writing of it. And so maybe nothing would have ever come of it, but the writing was just a joyful component of that for me, Uh, especially when it found balance. I didn't write all day. I wasn't trying to, you know, hit a certain number of words per day or any of those kinds of things. It was just all right in the mornings and I would delight in what I found. And then the afternoons I would walk and run and exercise and rest and do all kinds of other things too, but, but didn't necessarily have to put that pressure on myself. Hmm. Well, that sounds really wonderful actually. And, you know, creation, creating and especially Holy Spirit inspired creating is, I mean, it's a type of self-care. It's one that we don't always recognize that way, but it can be very life-giving. And certainly you slowed your pace down and you had less of a load to carry with you because you didn't have other demands on you. So it sounds like it was pretty freeing kind of thing cuz yeah. where you were headed initially is what I would do I had somebody offer me a sabbatical at one point and I had known people who went on sabbatical and came back and within a week they were still just as tired and strung out as before they left and and I mm-hmm. I said that to the individual and they said well they didn't do sabbatical right and then my brain oh, goes my to oh my goodness, there's a right way and a wrong way. And what does that look like? You know, so who needs that kind of um, pressure as they're going to just take a moment to come up for air and, and breathe. And so what would you say was your biggest discovery during sabbatical? Super good question. I think my biggest discovery was this joy of getting to clear the plate so that I had some time and space to really reflect on what I want to add back onto the plate when the time comes. Mm. I had filled up my plate to overflowing and the biggest discovery was that I really had this one unique time where it was okay to clear the plate. And then not right away, but like give myself some time 
to discern and pray about what needs to go back on that plate when I re-enter. Sabbatical is a unique time. I, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on it, but it's a unique time where people just are okay with the fact that your plate is clear. I, I really didn't have anyone who huffed and puffed or pushed back on me like, well, you really do need to be doing this stuff. Every single person I encountered respected the sabbatical almost, you know, to this, this extent of, uh, of saying, you know, I'm not going to contact you or send you a text message or those kinds of things. So with that in mind, I was able to really clear the plate and then very, I want to be very careful and discerning about what I add back onto the plate. Um, I'm also a helpless extrovert Mm -hmm. and I discovered that time alone is really, really, really valuable and necessary for me. So I did take a silent retreat at a monastery five days in Kentucky. Um, And it it is something that I want to do every year for the rest of my life if I can do that. Mm. I discovered that I just need that time in silence. I need that time in non-active, achieving, just spend time to rest in in the work of that community. Um, I was, I was a welcome guest and I felt like that, that welcome, that hospitality that I received um, gave me an opportunity to learn something about myself. And that is, I really do need this. I can't just be go, go, go around the people all the time. This is probably not something that anyone listening to this has never heard before but it was my first time to actually experience it and recognize, oh, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. Mm. Those are probably my, my two biggest discoveries. That's a just a huge gift, really. It really is. If you were going to describe the Tim right as you began your sabbatical and Tim at the end of sabbatical, how would you how would you compare them? Oh, that's such a great question. Largely because I remember struggling at the beginning. What do I do? What do I do? Again, that pressure where everyone is saying, this is an amazing opportunity. Don't mess it up. Like do sabbatical the right way. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. I don't know how to do sabbatical the right way. Finally, my wife asked me, what kind of person do you want to be at the end of the sabbatical? That's what I hear in your question. Mm-hmm. And I thought, what a good question this is. I would describe the Tim who began sabbatical as the one who uh, positively described wants to de- be deeply invested in the communities I'm a part of. And then the shadow side of that is to prove to those communities Look how good of a member of this community I am. Don't you want me to do more things for you? Uh, Don't you want me to offer more of myself to you? Uh, Don't you want to like let me do this and that and the other thing? Because look at all the things that I'm already offering. And it became almost frenetic in terms of wanting those communities to go, oh, yes, we do see these contributions you're making, and we want to have more of those contributions. So we would like you to do this and this and this and this and this. And so the Tim who entered sabbatical was probably blinded to the fullness of the plate that wasn't going to really allow me to be a truly good member of that community anyway. How could I do Mm -hmm. all of those things? Well... And who am I actually offering to that community if I am so, so thinly stretched? And the one who came out of sabbatical is the one who has, um, well, not to be too dramatic about it, but has rested with God um, to the degree that I would say, I don't sense the same pressure to prove myself to communities. Um, the communities I'm a part of. I have rested with the God who loves me. And that has been enough. And so 
I, I think I go back, look forward to reinvesting in those communities to say, I've rested with God and that that communion that I've been able to reopen is shaping the kind of person I'm becoming. And I am glad for that person to be investing, but I don't need to prove myself that I'm a worthy member of this community nearly as much. I am, I will be here and I will give myself, but I'm not going to have to work to prove that nearly as much. It's, it's almost as if this becomes more of the overflow of communion with God than it does my under my own steam, willing myself to just be great at being a member of this community, if that makes any sense. Sure, sure. It's the pressure of performance that I think is really, it's inherent in North American culture. And and we ascribe to that as a church on a few levels, for sure. And it's good that you got to experience that liberation. It's what it sounds like to me that you experienced as a result, of just a freeing that you don't have yeah. to perform. Um, Can I ask you, has that been your experience in your sabbatical self-care? It is. It is. It does. It does rein you in and brings you back to reality. What's important, what's not important. Like you said, what what can stay off the plate and it's okay. Sometimes we just, you know, um, like to add more and more and more on our plate and we get very, very busy. And, and I'm contending at this time that with the transition that the church, that's big C church is under, that it's essential for ministry leaders to hear the daring call of the spirit to keep in step with the spirit and do the new things that the spirit is asking. And it's hard to hear that when you're on the hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm saying that it is, it's essential. That's my little prophetic word for the, for I think the ministry that I feel called to do here is to encourage that uh, self We are finite, you know, <laughs> we, we yeah. really are not infinite people. We are finite and coming to terms with that and doing our best, giving God our best is also about, you know, this frail uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's kind of sturdy at the same time, sturdy and frail both, but we need to offer God our best and, and just take a little better care of it you know for <clears throat> well, one of the things i wanted to do while i was away is to meet with a couple of economists and theologians i really am interested in economic development kinds of things and so i thought this is a great time to just go learn from people and how communities can be lifted up by economic development and, and how theologians are involved in that and so there are two uh, members of the faculty at, at Covenant College in outside of Chattanooga. Um, this would be Brian Fickert is the economist and Kelly Capick is the theologian. Hmm. And they've written together on these things. It's kind of uh, When Helping Hurts is one of the, the, the books. Um, and there's all kinds of other things that they do through the, the Chalmers Center, which is doing incredible work. But I, I asked them, could I have an afternoon? Could I come and sit with you and, and meet? And so they were gracious enough to let me do that. What I didn't really realize is that Kelly Capick had been writing a book called uh, something like uh, You're Only Human and That's Okay or something along those lines. It's a book on finitude. I went there to go talk about theology and economic development. And we ended up most of the time over lunch just talking about finitude. And I I asked, where did some of this work come from? And well, it's not terribly surprising. It comes out of a person's own experience uh, of trying to breach the bounds of finitude. And finitude isn't bad. It's not evil. It just means there's limits. And when we try to breach the bounds of our finitude to exceed our limits, it isn't good for who we are as human beings. And so I'd recommend that, that book. I think for anyone listening, that's K-A-P-I-C is Kelly's last name. Um, and you can, I'm sure, find that anywhere. It's 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 good work and it's helpful, and, I think. And the title again is? 
Oh, let's see. I think something like <laughs> you're only human. Uh, okay. Only yeah. or only human, something along those lines. Yeah. I uh, have a good I have a good friend that right now I'll say this and this and this and this and sh I'll say I don't understand why it impacted me this way and she'll say, "Well, it's because you're human." And I don't know why that is such a stunning comment, <laughs> but I'll sit there and go, "Oh, yes. yeah." You know, yeah, I am only human. Yes. You know, what why am I I don't know. Anyway, it just it talks about, you know, it speaks to the the type A and the type, you know, all that, the Enneagram one, you know, all the things that um, contribute to the person that I am, I suppose. So I want to ask if you have anything else that you want to say to the audience about sabbatical. I, I think the other piece of this is um, balance. That became key to sabbatical for me. I felt like I needed to, when going in, it had to be the perfect sabbatical, which meant I was putting all this pressure on myself and I couldn't get to the sense of what a sabbatical needed to be. Finally, someone said, you need balance. So consider who you are when you are planning a sabbatical. You don't need to take their sabbatical. And so what I found was a sense of balance was exactly what I needed the most. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm an achiever. So I need to do something. You know, I couldn't just sit around, but I needed to balance what I was doing with rest, not just working my way, achieving my way into a community's affirmation. And so just balancing my every day, thinking about, okay, how much of this day needs to be devoted to prayer? How much of this debate day needs to be devoted to exercise? How much of my day needs to be devoted to whatever it is that I want to accomplish for the day? But just having that sense of balance was really, really a, a critical part of this. And then I felt really refreshed. I felt like I didn't, I felt like I honored the, the opportunity to, to just simply find my balance again. So that hopefully re-entering the daily work, I can go in with that sense of balance and recognize when I'm getting out of balance and do something to correct that. Mm. And that that is a valuable tool <laughs> to have, I think, in your arsenal to be able to recognize when you're um, because we just keep going, keep keep running on the hamster wheel, run on the hamster wheel, and and it's exhausting. But you don't realize it till you get off for a period yeah. of time and say, okay, this is what it feels like to be off. I need to make sure I don't get back on at full tilt all the time. Yes. And yeah. having that, that's so that's very valuable, very valuable indeed. And I want to ask you, because this is the Krabby Pastor podcast, and I always, say this i mean it's doing do yeah. self-care so you don't become the crabby pastor however friends of mine have also said nobody has said i don't understand why your podcast is called the crabby pastor i don't know what that means <laughs> entirely whether sure. they think i am the crabby pastor which i suppose i can be at times but i like to ask all my guests what makes what makes you crabby it is a really fun question to consider. And there are two things that immediately come to mind. I was reflecting yesterday on this, as a matter of fact, that usually I have to think about answers to questions. These came to mind immediately. And I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> but the first one is unclear communication that leads to confusion. Hmm. I absolutely despise, especially around the church, when we're trying to do something and people are confused because communication was unclear. Confusion to me, at least uh, in my experience in pastoral ministry, is largely related to communication. And we can, we can probably just do something that's a lot better if the communication is clear, people are looped in, they understand what's going on, what the purpose of the event is. Um, we've been able to, to hear and communicate across lines and then we all can go in a similar direction, the same direction if we are communicating clearly. But when there's confusion, when things are changing, when this group of people has different information than this group of people, and that pastor has different information than this pastor, 
it tends to just create unnecessary confusion, which brings the whole community down and, and uh, unnecessarily. So, mm. you know, that, that happens around institutions all the time. You, when, when I see something that isn't going as, as well as I would hope, I oftentimes can see, oh, that's where the communication was unclear. And we could have done a better job at making sure that's clear. So I love clear communication that leads to everyone being able to, to be empowered to do whatever it is that we're doing as best as they can, because they all know what's, what's going on there. And the other thing is, this is probably a, a deeper issue is I'll just say wasted potential. And I don't just say this makes me crabby in like a frustrated sense as a pastor. It's more of this deeper sense of sadness where, especially when you look at people who are filled with gifts and graces and talents and strengths, and those are oftentimes just not being utilized. And I see a lot of people in the church across the board, you know, offering a lot of these talents and gifts to companies that don't appreciate them, uh, value those people, the gifts and talents. I leadership structures and models in institutions that don't take advantage of the gifts that God is giving in certain people. In other words, like we don't structure for utilizing the gifts that God's giving us in these people. Um, that really makes me sad. I just think the church is a gift to the world or it's supposed mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes we centralize, we, we kind of um, draw such a tight circle around the, the people who are going to get to use their gifts and talents that others don't understand that they get to do this as well. They should be able to get to do this. And so I think that makes me just sad for institutions when so much of the, the gifting is untapped, unused, when people aren't asked to use their gifts and talents um, as part of the, the community. So those are probably the two things that make me if right. I'm a crabby pastor on yeah, yeah. the crabbiest days, that, that's it right there. So what do you what do you think could repair that untapped potential under usage? Yeah. Several things. The first one is uh, especially for church leaders to a adjust a theological vision of the church. We um we in the kind of Wesleyan tradition, the Church of the Nazarene, my native denomination is kind of is in terms of its polity it, it sometimes leans really episcopal sometimes it leans really congregational the and then sometimes we we don't know whether we are a, like a western church or an eastern church and what i mean what i mean by this is that the western church tends to be pretty structured top down there's like you know in the in the western ancient church the, what we refer to as the roman catholic church there's the pope and then it's like structured down from there the Eastern church tends to be a little more collaborative and that all has theological implications. What we think God is doing with and in the church, what is the church? And um, I have, I think been had my eyes open to Eastern sources that help us to lean toward a model of the church where the church is being enlivened by the spirit and that there isn't a single person in the church who isn't a part of this, this thing, this miracle of grace that is being poured out upon us. I mean, I think about Genesis 2 and the human being being breathed to life as a body. Well, the body of Christ is also being breathed to life as the church. And so what if we just open our lungs and allow this? So as a pastor, this reminds me that if I am just kind of isolating myself at the top of a pyramid, I'm probably not able to help the church breathe at its fullest extent. Hmm. If it's all my ideas, if it's all my programs, if it's all the things that I'm going to do, how many breaths of the spirit am I missing that are being breathed in people? So listening, opening capacities for us to discern together, just making that a more regular thing uh, as part of our institutional life um, is not necessarily inefficient. I think there are things that um, will breathe the church to life in, in powerful and profound ways. And this has largely come out of my own experience that the, the plans that I have come up with by myself are the ones that probably haven't 
seen the fruit that I would hope for. I feel like I've got to really push really, really hard and restructure a lot of things. My experience as a pastor is that when I can tune into what the spirit is breathing to life and then empower that, it is spectacular to watch oftentimes how much better it becomes when that that initiative is given space to just be. And in some sense, I want to say like, oh, this is the church. <laughs> this is the church. I am called to steward the gift of the spirit and to help the congregation listen for the gifts of the spirit that we might become the body of Christ alive, fully alive in that. And so I'm pretty passionate about that kind of stuff these days, like letting people know they are just as valuable, uh, even if you don't have the title pastor in front of you. Um, I think it's, it's really, really necessary for, for us to honor our, our calling as, as pastors. Sure, sure. And uh, the words you were just speaking were, I think, a good reminder of ministry leadership that uh, we're called to equip, we're called to enable others to find their spiritual giftedness and to live into that um, yeah. and, and enable that whole process so that, so that everybody experiences the fullness of what God has called them to be about. So Yeah, I think the churches I've been a part of that have really thrived uh, and I, I don't just mean that in terms of numerical growth. It, uh, oftentimes mm-hmm. that, that is a component, but, but like the, the mission thrives, the people thrive are the ones where someone isn't just acting out of their title. Like this is what the pastor does. This is what this person does, but is looking for the strengths and gifts that are present and saying, how can we, we structure around the gifts that are being given to us? Um, and so one of the most incredible things I saw early on in my, my time was a, uh, this wasn't necessarily, it was at a, a, a university, but having a director say, you know, usually the director used to get up and talk in front of the people. I'm not very good at that, but you know who is this person and this person. And the institution just began to thrive because we were tapping into the strengths and the giftings that were already there in the people, regardless of title. And that just became like all the boats began to lift because um, because he was willing to do that kind of thing. And I was really impressed by that. And I want to just continue that on in whatever way that, that I can. I like that. I definitely resonate with that. It speaks heavily to living into your strengths, into what God has already given you, as opposed to sitting around and wringing your hands about what you have not been given. And I think you just have to be faithful with what you have been given, and God is pleased with that. Well, I want to thank you, Tim, for coming on the Krabby Pastor podcast and encouraging sabbatical, and uh, hopefully this will resonate with a few of our listeners, and they'll decide that they want their ministries to be fueled by rest. So thank you very thank much you. for for coming on today. I'm thrilled for what you're doing. Thank you for doing it. (laughs) You're welcome. Hey, thanks for listening. It is my deep desire and passion to champion issues of sustainability in ministry and for your life. So I'm here to help. I stepped back from pastoral ministry and I feel called to help ministry leaders uh, create and cultivate sustainability in their lives so that they can go the distance with God and whatever plans that God has for you. I would love to help. I would consider it an honor. And in all things, make sure you connect to these sustainability practices, you know, so that you don't become the crabby pastor. <laughs>